to stand up and fight for our rights again. Yes, I know we've seen this before and wonder when will it end. But we don't want no racist Nazi, hateful wannabe, put pig rabbit, cheat and lion thief, leading our country. This is Tim Jackson, and I am super happy to have this guest with me today uh, for a lot of reasons, just who he is as a person, his music, and kind of the, the journalist in me is uh, excited to be talking to someone from Portland right now with a lot of crazy things that are going on there. But uh, let me just uh, introduce to you guys, Aaron Nigel Smith. Aaron, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, Tim. Happy to be here. It's, uh, it's, like I said, it's so good to have you. I've been excited about this interview ever since we got it scheduled. And let me just jump right in off the bat. You are based in Portland and every morning I look at Twitter and my Twitter feed is filled with all these videos from what looks like some sort of occupied country. And then I see this is Portland. And I'm like, yeah. how can this be an American city with this sort of uh, engagement coming in from from federal troops, secret police. What I mean, who are they? I don't know. Uh, so just kind of being on the ground there. What what has it been like for you? Uh, it's been really um, disturbing, you know, to see uh, sort of an invasion, you know, happen here in in the United States and in an American city. Um, to see the way in which the federal government is handling the situation, it seems more a position of posturing rather than a position of really being there to support and help and heal and bring our country together, you know? So it's a real, it's disturbing, it's a shame. Um, it's also really encouraging to see the level at which the protests uh, continue uh, to, um, you know, uh, continue throughout, you know, they, they don't seem to be dying down, you know, so that's the encouraging part that the youth are taking the lead and, and stepping up uh, and stepping into their power and, and assuming responsibility for this this revolution, you know. So so uh, bittersweet there, you know, some 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 disturbing some disturbing items and issues, but also encouraging to see uh, people standing up for their rights. Let me ask you a little bit about uh, so part of what certainly led to the protests, which then has brought uh, federal agents into Portland goes back to the George Floyd death uh, with the police officers. And you wrote a song about that. You've got a song and video called I Can't Breathe. And uh, it's a very powerful song, but, uh, and, and I would love for you to play it for us here. But before we, we get into that, just tell me a little bit about kind of your thoughts. I mean, as all of America saw that video, just kind of your thoughts on seeing that video, the thought about, oh my gosh, here we go again for how many times has this been? And then what kind of led you to go ahead and, and decide this is the time to write a song and, um, and, and produce this song and video? We've seen these injustices over time, you know, um, and with, media and social media, you know, being at the advanced level that it is, now we're able to actually capture and witness on a greater level the injustices, you know. Um, I can't say that I was surprised to see this type of behavior. It was just devastating to have to sit through and watch in real time, you know, that this was actually happening and there was no attempt, no um, help, no refuge for this individual, uh, for George Floyd, I should say. Um, it was just, it was shocking to my soul, not shocking to my intellect. Um, and it would hurt my heart, you know, on behalf of all, all oppressed people and specifically black men, you know, uh, of which I'm one, you know, so I've seen these, I've witnessed this, I've been, you know, uh, discriminated against numerous times, you know, so I, I can witness these stories, yet I haven't been killed yet, you know, for being black, you know, so 
what uh, I was just moved in that moment to reach within and see what comes out as I kind of do. And, and I try to just document my life story, you know, through song. And this was definitely a pivotal moment. Um, and so um, songs generally are come through. I see it as them coming through me, you know, as a gift or, or as a message. And so I just sat with, with my feelings and with my emotions and, and that's the song that, that came up. And, um, and it was really just for George. I, that I, it was for George Floyd that I wrote it, you know, um, and uh, something in me said I should go ahead and push it out a little bit further. And, and um, so I went ahead and released it and I actually produced a video as well. Um, that tried to capture the mood of, of, of the moment. And, and I'm glad I did it. You know, it's definitely not a commercial venture, rather um, just of my voice. And I think, you know, in times like these, people need to speak up, you know, um, and be, let their voices be heard and let you know where, where do you stand on this, this issue, on this matter, on this topic. And so that was where I, I allowed my voice to, to be heard. And it's a, it is a powerful song. And uh, obviously it's a, a fresh song. Um, it couldn't have been written prior to Memorial Day. So it was sometime in, just in the last couple of, of months. So it, it may not be a, a song that you're used to playing uh, in, in your, re well, nobody's touring and, and playing live right now anyway. But um, but I would love to, to see if you could uh, play that for us and, and give us a taste of, of what that song is all about. No, not again. Can't overstand another killing of a brother by a policeman. Watch the trend. It now go and 400 years ago it started. Here we go again. I can't breathe. Officer, please. I can't breathe. I'm not resisting, no, I can't breathe. Somebody help me, please, I can't breathe. You're killing me. Babylon won't quit. When them have we in the grip, rob we of our lives and won't even trip. No respect. What do you expect? Holy for brothers, them are slaughtered now and knee on the neck. I can't breathe. Officer, please, I can't breathe. I'm not resisting, no, I can't breathe. Somebody help me, please, I can't breathe. You're killing me. No, I can't breathe. You're killing me. No, I can't breathe. You're killing me. So yeah, man, a little bit of I can't breathe. New new tune for, for George Floyd. Yeah. Black Lives Matter. Justice. Fantastic. It's, a, it's a, a fantastic song and a good message. And um, I wanted to talk, to talk about messages in a lot of your, your music. And for the most part, you're really known as kind of a, a peace and love guy, I would say. And um, you've got a number of children's albums, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But before we get into that, um, I, I mean, I feel like I Can't Breathe was kind of set up by your album released in 2019 in our America? Well, you know, that uh, <laughs> was the, a big creative risk for me um, in our America. I had been only doing children's music really exclusively for the past, you know, 10, 15 years and um, really built a, a solid career doing that. And um, right after the election, really the first... Um, looking into my wife's eyes, you know, and just seeing the disappointment and um, just the injustice of, you know, uh, that election, how, from our perspective, I should say, um, led me to uh, start writing the song, Ring the Alarm. 
And um, as that was really my first, you know, venture into a mainstream sort of protest uh, song. And, and then that led to all the throughout that year and the two years of that election, more and more songs and more and more themes started to emerge, um, you know, based on what I was seeing in, in our America. And um, interestingly enough, there was a, a sign that started, a yard sign that became very, very popular that was uh, created by a group called Nasty Women Get Shit Done, um, a local nonprofit that is, you know, just really about um, truth and justice. And they had a yard sign that became very popularized and it stated all these things in our America, you know, Black Lives Matter, love wins, you know, um, uh, there's equality for 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 those uh, uh, with disabilities. Immigrants are welcome, and and all of these different mantras that should seem to me should be the mantra of of our America um, were represented right on that song, uh, right on that sign. And so I, I kind of took not only the the words of the sign, but literally the artwork of the sign too, and made that my my album cover. So all those in our America signs that you see around Portland and and really around the world now. Um, that became my album cover, and those themes of of the sign that were stated became the interludes of the album. Um, and really, I just tried to tell the story of my perspective of what I was seeing in our country. Um, you know, from again from my perspective. So right. it was it was a uh, a great journey and a, and a great creative risk, and I'm glad I went on it. Uh, yeah. First of all, "Ring the Alarm" was is a fantastic song. I've listened to that one over and over. Thank you. But another song that's on the album, uh, More Love, you also have a video for, and I was just trying to think if I had ever recalled a, a video that features sign language as a major part uh, of the, the song. Just tell me a little bit about first the song, More Love, and secondly, your decision to include someone you know, actively doing, doing sign language as, as part of the video. The song More Love was really, you know, um, me reaching within and, and saying, you know, what is it that I would want to see in our world? And, and so rather than complaining about it, you know, what is it that I'd want to see? You know, and I'd want to see more love for our family, more love for our community, more love for, for ourselves, you know. Um, and so those those are the themes that emerge from that song. And um, we I work with an organization called Caldera here in um, the Pacific Northwest that runs a summer camp for for youth and uh, it's an arts rich summer camp. Um, unfortunately, it's been shut down due to Corona this year. Um, however, um, one of the the um, the young lady that you see there that's doing the the sign language her at that camp and you know witness her doing some of the sign language for um for some of the scenes and and um exercises that they were doing with youth at camp and it occurred to me that it might be interesting to include that element in in this music video you know just so it's inclusive of everyone this message whether you can literally hear the words or not know that you know we want more love for you and for everyone and I should have uh, mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, In Our America was a number one album on the Billboard reggae chart. Is that right? It, it Incredibly, that creative risk led to it debuting at number one on the Billboard reggae chart. So it was definitely a monumental um, uh, moment. So I, I would say that's a successful debut to, uh, to come out at, at, at number one. But yeah, go ahead and tell me a little bit about um, you know, your, your career at doing children's music and kind of what led you into that to begin with? Doing children's music, I feel, was really one of my truest callings. You know, um, I had been touring the world previously, actually singing spirituals and gospel and light opera and oratorio, lots of choral music. Um, I was really trained as a classical singer. Mm -hmm. And so I had made a career and been able to successfully tour and do that. Um, and I, my first son was born and I was still you know, making a living touring. And at the same time, it was definitely more difficult to kind of connections and have a happy home and I'm always on the road, you know? <clears throat> and so I took a, a risk um, and said, hey, well, let's stop touring and let's see what happens if I just stay home and create a career, career at home. And that career became education really. And I just focused on teaching youth music um, in a number of schools and ultimately, you know, designed a curriculum and ultimately licensed that curriculum to others to teach and grew that as a, as a platform. Along with that came all a wealth of music because I wrote original music for, 
you know, 80% of all the classes or all the songs that we use would be an original song that I wrote. And so I built a catalog of, of children's music and decided, why not start recording it, you know, and, and ultimately, you know, back in, I guess, 2005 was the first release of Let's Pretend and, and, uh, and li- next uh, on August the 15th, I'll be releasing my sixth uh, children's album, actually, uh, and it's kind of like a greatest hits, uh, Aaron Nigel Smith Live uh, with One World Chorus, a uh, performance I recorded in Los Angeles last year. So it's actually all, all my children's music is kind of culminating, you know, in this release on August 15th of that, that live album. Um, it's been an incredibly fulfilling um, and rich experience to be able to, to write music for the youth, to instruct youth in classes, and also perform with youth all around the world, um, you know, and for youth all around the world. It's been um, a, a great calling. I call, call it my truest calling. Um, and uh, the transition sort of from children's music back into mainstream music has been really interesting. I would never say that I'll leave the children's music behind. I think that that's going to be an integral part of my career forever. And I see the opportunity now to, to expand into new markets and to reach even more, you know, audiences through the music, you know. You, you mentioned, you know, being trained and it, yeah, you're, you know, you do children's music and you do reggae music and not to downplay either of those, but your voice is no joke, man. And you are trained for real. And I know that you got training in the, uh, the American Boy Choir School. Just tell us a little bit about, um, you know, kind of coming up and, and doing that training and what is the American Boy Choir School all about? You know, um, to be honest, the introduction to music at such an early age for me, I believe, you know, saved my life. You know, it provided, um, it provided focus for me. It provided uh, hope. It provided light. It provided opportunity. Um, I was, I was raised by my grandmother, um, uh, and she had the foresight to get me involved with uh, a summer camp in Princeton, New Jersey called a Camp Albemarle, and it was a music-based camp, but there was also a school affiliated with it called the American Boy Choir School, and at the American Boy Choir School, they kind of cherry-pick students from the camp, and they also tour around the world um, a lot in the United States and, and would recruit students from the United States after they would do a concert in any given city. Um, these youth, um, I went to the camp, auditioned for the, uh, for the school, got in, um, and next thing you know, I'm, you know, I have as much music studies as I, as I do academic studies. The day was split in half, half music, half academics. And by the time I left my first year at that school, I had performed at Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, uh, performed on television and radio, you know, recorded albums. And, and by the time I left, it was, you know, I toured all around the world, recorded numerous albums and, you know, really uh, had a, had a career in classical music emerging, you know, at such a young age. So it was monumental. Um, unfortunately the boy choir school, um, it has, is no longer here. It had to shut down, um, due to some financial issues, uh, several years back, um, uh, which is unfortunate, but it was definitely set me on the path that I, that I am today, that I'm on today, you know, on after the boy choir school, I went to a school called Interlock and Arts Academy, which is an art performing arts uh, uh, school that was also a boarding school based in Michigan. Uh, That's where I met my wife. She was a dance major there and I was a voice major. Um, And then on from there, went to study at Manhattan School of Music. Um, So, you know, music I studied, you know, from age 10 all the way through college, you know, in a very intense uh, sort of classically centered uh, for a uh, study, you know, a practice, I should say. Right. And, and so, and you had done that for a little while. It is interesting that you got into children's music, but obviously you can see how you had a love for children's music starting and are kind of wanting to give back because music yes. was so important to you from a young age. Absolutely. I mean, I formed, my wife and I formed a nonprofit called One World Chorus now, back in 2009. (laughs) So it's 11 years, I guess now. So um, we formed that nonprofit really with the hope uh, to to be able to, like you said, give back to the community and to, you know, plant little musical seeds wherever we can, you know, not to make these youth into musicians necessarily, just to give them the opportunity and to show them, you know, uh, 
uh, give them access to this create creative tools, you know, which, right. which really can enhance all of our, you know, studies and all of our lives of just this access to arts as we've, you know, studies have shown. Yeah. And one world chorus, I, I definitely wanted to touch on that. Um, it, it's a fantastic organization from what I've been able to see. And also some of your music is, is kind of with or featuring One World Chorus as well. So, so tell me uh, a little bit, just sort of explain that nonprofit a little bit more and, uh, and I'll link to it um, down below. So we're a 501c3 nonprofit and our mission really is to uh, promote peace uh, through music and the arts. And we empower you through these programs. We have drumming programs, chorus programs, and multimedia production programs that typically were done in school systems and community centers around the nation um, uh, uh, and around the world, actually, through partnerships with in Jamaica and in Kenya. Uh, with Corona, we're kind of uh, shifting our model right now and really focusing on online learning. And um, we're going to introduce maybe some pod learning programs in the near future as well. But really, our, our real core mission was really to empower youth and to promote peace through the medium of group singing, group drumming, and group production. Uh, we've had more than 5,000 youth come through our programs over the years, and, and we've served youth from preschool all the way up through high school. Um, and so it's really, uh, it's been amazing to the support that we've received and the partnerships that have emerged uh, over the years. And it's, you know, it's a scary time, and also we see it as an opportunity really for growth and for innovation, most importantly, uh, right now. And just be before you started One World Chorus, and you're the artistic director of that uh, now, I believe. Um, yes. And just before you started that, you happened to be on the PBS show Between the Lions. Tell me a little bit about uh, being on that show and sort of how that came about. Well, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, I'd started touring around the country doing my children's music and, and I became known for that. And uh, along the way, I ended up uh, meeting uh, people that from the show Between the Lions, they were doing a show. Uh, I was like the first start opening the show and they were closing a show, uh, I think it was in Boston. And we uh, did the performance and, you know, separate. And then we realized, hey, there's something there. Maybe we should try and do something together. Um, and I happened to still be in town for a couple of days. And so we just in the moment experimented on doing a joint show where I did music for their puppet show, their live touring puppet show. And, um, and that led to me touring with them, uh, which then led to me filming uh, the next season, seasons nine and 10 with them and also producing and writing music for, uh, to fill up the, uh, uh, to, uh, to score the show. So it was an amazing opportunity to be uh, exposed uh, to through PBS. And, and it's definitely been uh, great to, to have that access and to have that on the resume for sure. So let me kind of wrap up with um, just sort of thinking about, because you do have a lot of, of positive music and uh, a lot about love and, and peace and it, it brought me around, just this morning, I was filling out a survey. Um, it was for the Unitarian Universalist, in fact. And it had the open-ended question on there, uh, what gives you hope? And I, I was, it kind of scared me that I was absolutely stuck. I was like, <laughs> I, what? I don't know. So yeah. here, Nigel Smith, what gives you hope today? What gives me hope is the youth. I believe that um, our youth that are coming up in this time have witnessed things that, you know, extremely traumatic, you know what I mean? From 9-11 to, to, to here, you know, uh, to the financial crisis, to, 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 co to racial injustice, to COVID, you know, they've witnessed a lot, you know, and I'm impressed at the level of maturity that I see in them and, and relentlessness that I see in them. I don't feel that the youth are gonna give up this fight uh, until they see some change. Uh, so I say, yeah, I'm hopeful uh, the youth give me hope in this moment, I would say. Related to that a little bit is I guess, what is your prescription for making the world a better place right now? You know, I believe that it starts with each one of us as individuals really taking an account of ourselves, you know, and where we are and uh, where our weaknesses are 
and where our strengths are and where we can help. Uh, and I think we have to all make that personal assessment. You know, I don't think we can be told we need help and we need, you know, some, some guidance, but we ultimately can't be told what to do. I feel like we need to be called and we need to be motivated from within to make the change that will really manifest the world that we want to see. So I think it's, it takes a lot of self-reflection, you know, uh, on each, on the part of each one of us. Um, and then action on that reflection. You know, it's one thing to reflect and to reason in your mind, and but then to, to put actions to what are these hopes that you have, what are these dreams that you have, what are these aspirations you have, what is this change that you want to see, you know, creating an opportunity to actually implement and move forward, you know. So, um, yeah, reflection and action. Thanks a lot. We uh, appreciate that prescription. I think it's something we all need to to ponder and and reflect upon and and do take action. Um, but man, Aaron Nigel Smith, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thanks for singing a song for us, and uh, and just thanks for continuing to put out music. And we'll look for the the children's album. Absolutely, it's a joy to speak with you. Thanks so much for having me, Tim. Love and peace to your audience. And uh, yeah, let's keep moving. It's not too high to count And not too many miles And not too many dollars And not too many smiles If it's just the one you can go along the way If it's just the one you can go Yeah, man One woman, one man, one boy, one